Woi woi, woi woi, woi woi. Then it then go on the radio again. Yo, if you want to smoke free weed, go board yourself. You need to go plant a seed. Go board yourself. Make your knowledge increase. Go board yourself. Go board yourself. Go board yourself. You want to smoke. Hey, all right. Welcome to episode number 89 of Grow Bud Yourself. We have a great show in store for you guys today. Our guest is Chris Van Hook. He is the founder of the Clean Green Certified Program. We have a great cultivation segment with Strain of the Fortnite, uh, a good grow tip on white flies and grow Q&A, and overall a great show for you guys, all brought to you by Excelsior Extracts, Sweet Leaf Nutrients, Rocket Seeds, and Organic Rev Growth Stimulant. Stick around. Episode 89 is coming at you. What if I told you you could grow healthier, faster growing plants and increase your yield? Well, you can with Organic Rev. You can even try it out for free. Rev is a growth stimulant, not a nutrient. So simply adding Rev to your current regimen can deliver dramatic results. I've been using Rev and it works great. I tried it out on my houseplants first and they absolutely love it. They responded immediately by greening up and looking healthy and strong. Like me, many cannabis growers have turned to Rev to increase fertilizer efficiency, improve nutrient uptake and root zone development, stimulate seed germination, and reduce transplant shock. And for a limited time, Grow Bud Yourself listeners can try out Rev for free. Simply head to organicrev.com slash GBY10, click on the free trial tab on the top left, pay $5 for shipping and handling, and get a free 4-ounce bottle of Organic Rev today. I know, once you try it, you'll love it as much as I do. And you can get 10% off your first order of Organic Rev with the promo code GBY10. So visit organicrev.com slash GBY10 and find out what Rev can do for your plants. All right, welcome back, and as always, thank you to DJ Jacques and Winstrong. We love the tune. It hypes me up. It gets me psyched. I fire it up and get real hype. So thank you to you guys. You guys made the show with that song, and uh, we got a good one for you guys today. Mike, how are you feeling? Uh, yeah, no, no, I'm all right. I'm, I'm also hyped. <laughs> you sound it. <laughs> yeah. You sound it. Thank you. Uh what do we got? Like what? Uh, well, we got a great got show. We got we got Chris coming up as an yes. interview, and then we got some cultivation. But you know, we got a little cannabis news to talk about too. Let's do it. Uh, yeah, man. So you know, some good stuff, some bad stuff. Um, let's start off with uh, with Texas actually, and our friend Beto O'Rourke. He easily won the Democratic nomination for governor of Texas in the primary last week. And then after winning the nomination, he made a promise. O'Rourke vowed to legalize cannabis in Texas if he's elected governor this fall. And so while legalization in Texas, that kind of sounds like a bit of a pipe dream, that tide has slowly been turning in the Lone Star State. Uh, according to a University of Texas study, voter support for legalizing pot has been on the rise over the last decade. So back in 2010, only about 40% of Texas voters were in favor of legalization. But now that number has actually jumped to around 60% in favor, according to that study. So O'Rourke is up against incumbent Governor Greg Abbott this November, and that election could potentially decide the future of pot in Texas of course, legalization clearly still faces an uphill battle uh, in that state. Yeah. You know, I lived in Texas uh, briefly from like age four to age 11 or so. Right, yeah. Yeah. And, I, you know, it's never been a, a much of a bastion <laughs> of uh, <laughs> cannabis rights or anything. But people smoke and, and you know, people enjoy cannabis uh, all throughout Texas. I think that's a great place to grow as well. I know they're doing hemp. Uh yeah, I support Beto 100%. I think, uh, you know, obviously Abbott is standing in the way of legalization in Texas. And, you know, I would have th just the idea of legalization in Texas would have been absurd, you know, 10 or 15 years ago, or mm -hmm. especially when I was there in the 80s. Or, and, but now that we've seen other states like Oklahoma and, uh, you know, even 
Virginia and, and a lot of these states where you never would have thought that uh, things like this would be happening, they're happening. So it's not outside the realm of possibility. I urge anyone in Texas who cares about uh, cannabis or, you know, women's rights or a lot of other <laughs> other subjects to vote for Beto. Uh, I know there's a lot of fear about liberals and this whole thing about, uh, you know, bringing in, I guess, a socialism or something. Those are are, are are buzzwords that are meant to put fear into people. That is not the case. No one is trying to do that. Uh, really, you know, what these policies are is just what people want. Obviously, if 60% of the people want legal weed, it should be legal in Texas and everywhere else. So I support Beto in that uh, governor's run. I hope he wins. Uh, I support him 100% in Texas. And I think that would be a huge huge thing for texas i think financially i think um just for the state in general just to stop locking up people that are cannabis users and and growers and it as mentioned that it's a huge state and it could produce a tons and tons of high quality cannabis if allowed to so i'm all for it and i think uh, i'm glad that beto won the nomination i hope he wins the governorship as well and uh keep up the great work Beto O'Rourke. Yeah, just just getting rid of uh, Greg Abbott, I think, would be a, a big step in the right direction there for Texas. Agreed. So let's uh, s- let's uh, just mosey over to a another state very close by uh, that also doesn't have the most favorable cannabis laws. I'm talking about Louisiana, where uh, Gary Chambers is running for U.S. Senate. And uh, we mentioned him a few episodes back. He had that really interesting campaign ad uh, talking about how every 37 seconds someone's busted for cannabis and how uh, black people are four times more likely to be arrested for uh, a pot infraction than white people. So Gary Chambers is back in the news because he recently visited a drive through cannabis dispensary in Illinois and he posted on his Instagram uh, going through this. And I just think the thing that's really encouraging, interesting, um, galvanizing about Gary Chambers is a lot of politicians these days support legalizing cannabis or support decriminalizing or, you know, cannabis uh, consumers' rights. But, But Chambers is actually in it. He, like, gleefully is using cannabis. He's smoking a blunt in his uh, campaign ad, and now he's going through this uh, drive through So it's really interesting to see a politician running for uh, the Senate who is uh, unapologetically consuming cannabis. Yeah, I think it's great, and I think he makes a great point in that ad. Uh, even though, you know, the shock factor is that he's smoking a blunt, he's also talking about incarceration rates and uh, how much money we spend in order to incarcerate people for cannabis for nonviolent offenses. And I think he used that, the shock of a candidate smoking a blunt in the ad. And it's only 38 seconds of an ad or something, but that shock of, okay, here's a guy smoking in the ad, but saying very important things that need to be heard. And I know he got a big burst of, uh, of funding from that. I, you know, I hope it seems like he did. And I think it's great that he's showing that this is how it could be. I mean, they have drive-through alcohol in in Louisiana where you can actually buy daiquiris driving a car and you can have them put a, an extra shot of 151 right on top of your daiquiri and drive right drive away with the straw in your mouth. Uh, and if that's the case, then you got to allow cannabis. And I would I for one think, you know, going down for for uh jazz fest or uh, mardi gras or any of these other amazing things that happen in new orleans and throughout louisiana would be much more enjoyable if we could legally consume cannabis instead of uh binging on alcohol in the way that most people are encouraged to when they do those those type of events so i'm all for it i support him as well and i think uh more candidates need to be more forthcoming about their cannabis use and about even if they don't use cannabis, what it can do for taxes and for their local government. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Unfortunately, the next story is sort of the opposite of that. Um, You probably remember a couple months ago, the, um, the Biden administration 
actually canned uh, some some administration members because they had previously consumed cannabis, and the Biden administration decided that that meant that they could no longer keep their jobs and their security clearance. So now, uh, smoking pot is not the only thing that will preclude you from working for the Biden administration. They uh, recently announced that they're going to potentially deny security clearances and jobs to people who have invested in companies that are involved in marijuana businesses. So just uh, investing in a company might be enough for you not to get a job with the Biden administration. And, and here's a quote from that document. It says, uh, eligibility may be negatively impacted if an individual knowingly and directly invests in stocks or business ventures that specifically pertain to marijuana growers and retailers. Decisions to willfully invest in such activity could reflect questionable judgment and an unwillingness to comply with laws, rules, and regulations. Oh, man. <laughs> yeah. It's hard to... You know, to cheer too hard. I mean, obviously, we're better off than we were with the last guy, but this guy is not the greatest guy, and these policies are really outdated. He he was a mastermind of of these policies in the '90s. He's not no friend of cannabis, um, and you know the again these policies are just it's crazy. The majority of the public supports this, and if anything. Um, recently, I know other politicians came out against politicians being able to invest in stocks, uh, you know, gasoline stocks and energy and all these things while they're setting policy. And that makes a certain amount of yeah. sense. But but people investing in cannabis companies I, it just seems weird. I mean, there's a lot of reasons we can talk about cannabis investing as a separate topic. I mean, it's <laughs> not the not always the greatest investment in the world either these multi-state operators and these companies that are public in the cannabis space as they call it um you know they they go up and down as much as a lot of others uh and and there's some unscrupulous characters out there trying to cash in on with the weed marketplace so to speak but whether biden administration staffers invest in cannabis or not really should be the last Thing on the minds of anyone right now uh, dealing with you know war and inflation and, and COVID and all these other things. We, we need banking. We need prisoners released from prison that are in there for nonviolent offenses. We need uh, social equity and all kinds of uh, incentives for people to, to reduce alcohol and, and pharmaceuticals and all these other things. And we need increased... We actually need more investment in in cannabis infrastructure and in the industry but the small businesses of the industry the 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 big boys are going to be fine all the ones that are traded on the stock market are huge companies in multiple states and sometimes uh in canada and multiple countries so you know while i wouldn't encourage anyone to buy these stocks anytime soon i also think it's crazy to restrict people from being able to buy them if they feel like buying them and they think that's a reasonable investment so again the biden administration can be disappointing uh but when i consider the alternative <laughs> you know i uh i as i get older i'm like well i'm appreciative of the baby steps that we're taking but they really are tiny little baby steps and we need to take some some huge steps i don't think it's going to happen under this administration unless they really get their heads out of their asses and figure out that this is what the general public wants this will get you more votes this will bring in more money and ultimately those stocks will rise if uh if the industry is allowed to flourish. So it is, it, it's always two steps forward, one step back. Uh, and I, it, the last thing we need is the administrations that are in power to hold, hold us back. So it's disappointing and unfortunate and I'll call it like I seize it. You know what I mean? Like I'm not a cheerleader for either side, but I certainly don't, uh, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. 
it, it, it's a silly policy and they really need to figure things out because they're losing out on all this youth vote that would come out if they just acknowledge what people what the general public wants the politicians have always been behind whether they're democrats republicans libertarians greens or otherwise although greens are pretty good but hey <laughs> we all love our greens <laughs> Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, Biden started out pretty good. You know, early on in the um, administration, he said that prior use of cannabis wasn't going to automatically disqualify applicants. And it turns out that that is the most lenient policy since the Carter administration. But then since then, he ousted um, administration members that had used cannabis previously. And now this weird directive that, that says you'll lose your security clearance and possibly your job if you invest in pot companies. It's a, it's a strange downturn when it seems like everywhere else in the country, it's trending in a different direction. Yeah. I mean, they're shooting themselves in the foot. Yeah. And like, who gotta, are they pandering to with this? It doesn't really make sense to me. It really doesn't. I think they're just, they're afraid to be seen as soft on crime I guess, if that's still a thing. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, uh, I don't know. But I, I I hope that cooler heads will prevail and that there's some cool heads around <laughs> that can, like, mellow things out a bit. Yeah, there you go. Mellow out with Chuck Schumer and Cory Booker. Um, exactly. All right, so that's what's going on uh, federally in this country. Let's just quickly uh, do one more story here briefly. Costa Rica legalized medical marijuana uh, last week, and that happened after a two-year debate. They are the 11th Latin American country to uh, legalize medical pot, so that's pretty cool. Yes, love it. Pura vida. I love my, uh, my Costa Ricans. I've uh, been down there once... In the past, I'd love to go back. It's a beautiful country, a wonderful place to grow cannabis, I'm sure. And, uh, you know, when I went down, I, I brought my own cannabis. But uh, hopefully they can start growing their own and make some money off of it and have a whole tourism industry built on it. Because there's beautiful uh, surf waves on the Pacific coast. There's beautiful volcanoes and, and, and jungles and things to visit inland and then there's the whole caribbean side that's like somewhat rastified and fun as well so uh love uh my ticos in costa rica pura vida i hope uh things work out i don't think it should just be medical i think they should have full full legal adult use but you know again baby steps and they're taking them and uh hopefully i can end up at a surf camp down there just uh blazing and surfing and having some fun there you go latin america actually has been uh, pretty progressive on this uruguay is the first uh, country in the in the world to legalize cannabis so that's uh, gonna do it for a look at what's going on in the cannabis world but we have a really interesting interview coming up yes indeed we're going to be talking with chris van hook he is the founder of the green clean certified program which is basically uh organic cannabis program uh but for cannabis which you can't call organic so we're going to get into all of that with chris he's been uh doing that since 2004 uh and involved with uh the legal side of things and the agricultural side of things uh for a long time so uh very interesting green clean certified program is uh the first of its kind uh, as a third-party certification system for people growing sustainable, green, uh, eco-friendly cannabis, which is important and uh, very excited to speak to him. So why don't we take a break and come back with Chris Van Hook. If you're ready to start your own home grow, you're going to need some seeds. Fortunately, our sponsor Rocket Seeds has you covered. You can find seeds for hundreds of high quality cannabis varieties at rocketseeds.com, including many of our strains of the Fortnite. Rocket Seeds boasts an incredible inventory of quality tested cannabis seeds. Whether you're looking for feminized, autoflowering, regular, CBD, or fast version seeds, Rocket Seeds has it all. Plus, Rocket Seeds ships internationally and discreetly 
and provides excellent customer service. And as a special promotion just for our listeners, you can use the code GBY10 to get 10% off your order at Rocket Seeds. So follow at Rocket Seeds on Instagram. Remember to tell them Danny sent you. And check out rocketseeds.com today and get growing. All right, welcome back. And we have a great guest for you guys this week. Uh, We are talking with Chris Van Hook. He is the founder of the Clean Green Certified Program, uh, started in 2004. It is the first uh, third-party certified program uh, for what we would call, I guess, organic uh, farming for cannabis, but we will get into the semantics as well. But uh, uh, welcome, Chris. Thank you very much, Dan. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm honored to be on a podcast with you. <laughs> Appreciate it. We've wanted to have you on for a while. We've had uh, some Clean Green certified farmers uh, on and uh, and product licensees as well. Uh, but we wanted to have you on to basically uh, explain, you know, what Clean Green certified is all about. How you know what are the steps that people take? Uh, how can uh, producers and processors? Uh, benefit from this? How can uh, just the average person shopping in a dispensary uh, benefit? So why don't you take us back to how you got started in uh, in cannabis and, and starting the Clean Green Certified Program? Absolutely. And thank you. Well, I was a, I'm a trained marine biologist. So I had a 30-year career in marine biology um, offshore here in California. Uh, I was uh, working in abalone mariculture. I was uh, I had an abalone farm, and uh, we started having legal problems. And um, you know the harbor district quit dredging, and so we had to hire an attorney. And no abalone farmer had any money for an attorney, so I got online and said, "Okay, let's go. I guess I'll go become one." So as I was working my way through law school, after you know thirty two years on the water, uh, um the medical cannabis, the USDA organic program started. And uh, a friend of mine called and said, hey, you've got such a background in agriculture. Why don't you get accredited by the USDA to issue that USDA logo? And so I did back in 2004. I was one of only 84 entities around the world that became accredited by the USDA organic program. I built a company uh, across seven or eight states sold it about six years ago, and I continue to be an attorney for farmers and processors who are slogging through the USDA organic program. I've been in Standard Ag my entire life. This The Clean Green program is based from, birthed from the USDA organic program, but because it's cannabis and because it's a private program, we can react more quickly and we can um, be a little bit more realistic, less bureaucratic. Right. And so we, we talked, uh, I mentioned that, you know, the word organic is somewhat problematic in this situation because cannabis being federally illegal can't actually be recognized as using right. the word organic uh, or in particular the USDA uh, certification of organic. Can you talk a little bit about, uh, you know, that and, 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 and that situation? Yeah, absolutely. You know, and that's how the Clean Green program started is I got a, uh, an email from a little old lady in Pasadena, and I love starting the story that way because it's true. And she said, can you certify my ca- medical cannabis as USDA organic? And I said, I don't know, let me find out. And the California, the head of California Ag said yes, but the federal government said no. And they issued a, a decree or a guidance statement that uh, cannabis was not eligible for USDA organic certification because it was not a federally recognized agricultural crop. So this, you know, person kept encouraging me, can't you start, can't you do something for the cannabis program? And I said, sure, we'll start the clean green program. And the interesting thing was, is that I was out in the field certifying tomatoes and apples and pears and cheese processing plants for the organic industry. So it wasn't that much of a reach for me to tie in a cannabis farm or a oil, you know, processor farm uh, throughout my travels. So I was spending up to 300 days a year in my sprinter van um, traveling different farms and ranches across the way. So uh, 
you, you know, that's where it started from. And that's how, uh, so the federal government does not allow you to call it organic. The interesting thing was when we started, everybody was calling everything organic. And so we really had to uh, spend some time educating the consumer and educating the growers that you're not actually allowed to call it organic. When a cannabis farmer says, oh, we're organic, what they're really saying is that we know nothing about the organic program. And the consumer really needs to understand that there is no organic cannabis. And that's why the Clean Green program uses the slogan and has for years that we're the closest you can get to organic in the cannabis industry because of our qualifications, which are, you know, far surpass any other certification company. And um, the fact that, uh, you know, we work also in the USD organic program. Yeah. Well, let's talk about some of those qualifications for uh, a grower, for instance. Uh, what are the steps that uh, a, a a farmer would take in order to become uh, clean green certified? Uh, and does that include uh, on-site inspections and soil samples and all types of things of that nature? Well, that's a great question. <clears throat> and we model it right off, pretty very closely to the USDA organic program. And what that means is the, the main issue with the Clean Green program are your input, your soil amendments and inputs, and your pest controls. Those are the two real, almost anything else can be trained around or managed around. We really start with the review of all the fertilizers and soil amendments that are being used at the farm, whether it's an indoor farm, a greenhouse farm, or an outdoor farm. And then we also look at all their pest controls. Are they using, um, you know, biological pest controls with the neem oil and safer soaps? Or are they using the old Eagle 20? Mycobutanol was a big one. Um, <clears throat> and so, so the program, it consists of a record review. Generally speaking, pre-pandemic, it also included a on-site inspection but also we take a soil sample and we don't send it to a, a different weed labs throughout the different states. We send it to the same federally accredited agricultural laboratory that we use for the organic program. So that's why we're limited to soil samples, but we send it to a federally licensed lab for pesticides. So it really is the most in-depth um, agricultural certification program for farmers out there. Yeah. And, you know, the cannabis industry, uh, production industry in particular, uh, has been accused of, of, of having a pretty large carbon footprint. A lot of farming has been done indoors, for instance, because of cannabis prohibition. Um, and hopefully that's moving more towards outdoors and greenhouse farming, uh, taking advantage of sunshine. Um, and, and so you're helping the farmers uh to grow more organically and have a, a smaller carbon footprint. But why should the consumer care or pay a little bit extra in, in many cases uh, and want to consume an organic cannabis product over a chemically grown product? Well, yes. Whether you're an indoor farmer, a greenhouse farmer, or an outdoor farmer, an integral part of the Clean Green program is that you need to have a carbon footprint reduction program and that program needs to improve each year. So that has led to just huge advances in carbon footprint reduction. You know, if you think this is the 19th year of our program and if you think back 19 years ago, people were using heavy magnetic ballasts in their lights. Uh, the lights were so hot that they needed fanning and air conditioning. And I, I'm proud to say that we have some of the most efficient indoor operations, I'm going to say, in the world that are clean, green certified. People that are dehumidifying their grow rooms and using that water for their irrigation, that are using combinations of multiple LED lights. Uh, so it's in, and then same with the greenhouse, the, uh, the, you know, extremely efficient light enhanced, light depth, solar powered greenhouses. But as far as why the consumer, again, it's the same organic versus conventional farming. First of all, the consumer has a great strength and power from an environmental standpoint by the choices they make. Are they purchasing organic veg fruits and vegetables? Are they purchasing them at a farmer's market from their neighbor down the road? Um, so consumer dollar spending 
can play a huge beneficial role to environmental uh, sustainability. But if someone's not concerned about that at all, well, then they ought to be looking for the Clean Green logo simply because it's the most award-winning cannabis program in the world. There are more award-winning growers. There, are, you know, It's really interesting because when you look at uh, the High Times Cups in San Francisco and Seattle, the Dope Magazine's Judge's Choice, the Emerald Cup year after year, the Golden Tarp Award, it's really interesting that those top growers are not using a lot of these synthetic stuff that's on the market. You ask them how they're growing and they're all building their living soil. They're all using complex composts and teas, soil drenched teas and folate. So the real, you know, the re- even if you don't care about environmentalism, you should, if you're looking just for top quality award-winning cannabis, you're going to find it in the clean green program. Yeah, you know, and and having judged many, many of those contests, I think more than anyone on earth at this point, uh, a lot of times, you know, you'll have the same strain grown by multiple different growers. Uh, If you're in SoCal and you're judging the Indica varieties, you're going to get a lot of Kush varieties, uh, a lot of very similar things, a lot of times maybe even the same cut grown by a different grower. And at that point, you really are judging the grower. And the distinction being also that this is a consumable product. Uh, and many of these chemical nutrients are meant for ornamental products, right? Like poinsettias and things like that, that are not something you consume or also concentrate into an even more concentrated form. And I think um, that's another interesting part of the situation as well, because you also certify processors. And uh, what exactly are the, the, the steps that processors need to take to be clean, green certified? Well, you know, again, we look to the USDA Organic Program, which is a global standard for our our procedures and our process. And basically, in order to make organic ketchup, you need to start with organic tomatoes. So if you're going to make an organ- a clean green certified oil or edible, one of the main stays is you have to start with a clean green certified product, which comes into your processing facility under a track number, a lot number. Now, now that it's legal in so many states, the, the tracking is really improved. You know, 19 years ago, it was a much simpler tracking system, but we still required it. And um, and then so you're using a clean, green certified product. So you know that it hasn't been sprayed with pesticides and it's been properly grown. And then you're not allowed, none of the oils or vapors are allowed to use any artificial thinners, no artificial flavors. So really, if you're looking for a high quality um, full plant resin, which I love, uh, you know, you've got to look for the clean green program because these guys are not using thinners to get them into their little cartridges. They're not using artificial flavors, you know, when they're making their muffins or their cookies or, or their tinctures or their gummy bears. And so there was a, uh, an issue a couple of years ago up through Washington where a lot of the oil manufacturers were, were being pulled for, um, pesticides and for contaminants. And I'm proud to say that not one clean green farmer was ever pulled from that. So, you know, I'll just have a throw out for, look for clean green certified oils, you know, and I think you'll notice a delicious difference. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, as mentioned, when you're concentrating anything, you're concentrating everything. And uh, if there's pesticides there, uh, that's going to also be reflected in that concentrate. Um, One thing that I noticed that you guys also do um, in your inspections is check to make sure plants are disease and mold free. And I think that's another thing that a lot of people are getting away with taking, you know, moldy cannabis and and processing it into, uh, you know, concentrates and cheap sort of vape carts and things. And uh, particularly medical patients should really understand uh, that even if there there's not a high level of pesticides, there can be there can still be mold uh, and disease that can cause harms when concentrated and, and inhaled. Yeah, that's a really great uh, question and comment because uh, the third one of the third leg of the Clean Green Certified Program is an actual agricultural inspection, and we've had a very good you know one example is uh, an inspection that we did. That was for a greenhouse operation, greenhouse outdoor operation, and they were using all organic fertilizers and organic pest controls. 
But when we went out to the actual farm site to do the inspection, it was just unattended outdoor and green horse grouse plants that had just become totally encased in molds and mildews. So that farm passed because they were using organic products, but failed that third leg, the agricultural inspection. And so I don't care if they're grown using organic. We just don't want that stuff in the program. So, yeah, that's a very good point because there's a lot of cannabis remediation that goes on with um, damaged crops now. And uh, you again, that's a, another good reason for looking for a clean green certified product because that, that does not occur. Right. And now I know you're you, you started up in California in, in NorCal, and I actually you know personally remember I think around 2009 visiting one of the earlier uh, clean green certified farms uh, up there in NorCal. Uh, but now uh, I believe that you've expanded into other states and maybe even other countries. Can you talk a little bit about uh, you know where things stand in in 2022? Yeah, well, we started in Northern California. Um, you know, that was uh, that still is our our ground zero, so to speak. But we were fortunate enough, after, you know, after we won the High Times Cup in 2010, it really generated a lot of interest. And then a grower, one of our growers won it in 2011, 12, 13, 14, and 15. And so, and then started winning the Emerald Cup just, you know, 2000, you know, 11 and 12 and the San Francisco. So by the time so many awards started coming in that people from other states started to call. And I remember our first call from Oregon. Wow, we're in two states. Then Washington. Wow. And now we're in seven or eight states, uh, Canada and Puerto Rico. And so we're from Nova Scotia to Seattle. It was kind of fun. We, I, The receptionist at the time was kind of a young gal from our small town in Crescent City. And um she goes, oh, we got our first job in Canada. I'm like, great. Where is it? Well, isn't it just there above Seattle? You're up in Seattle, aren't you? And I'm like, just check the address, would you? She goes, yeah, it's up in Canada. And she goes, yeah, it's uh, Nova Scotia. <laughs> <laughs> Couldn't be further away. <laughs> so there were definitely a few uh, times that, you know, was, uh, uh, you know, not necessarily cost effective to go, but we're opening up new areas. And, you know, what was fun back when we started is that, you know, the only reason why the Clean Green program was ever able to go up to the different farms and ranches back in 2004 is because I was an attorney. And so, um, you know, we were taking attorney client privilege up to the farms. You know, back then, as you know, Northern California is, is so cut up into 20 and 40 acre parcels and people don't go from parcel to parcel. So I was really like the first person that was going to all these different farms just everywhere. And uh, so it was fun, you know. Uh, was fun and we had to start off with just basic stuff like back then you know people were harvesting outdoors walking into the woods going to the bathroom and coming back so no you need a hand wash station there so just sort of like simple basic things became sort of industry changing and uh mm -hmm. and it, it was uh it was really fun then um you know it got to the point where you could be stopped in northern california with a a clean green certification and a clean green certified co-op. Remember back then we were doing collectives and cooperatives and, you know, you would, you would get, you would be waved on. You'd be like, yep, you're compliant. So back then there was a much larger emphasis on compliance as well. So if a government entity, whether it was Oregon, Washington, or California, if the farmer or the driver pulled out a clean green binder, they, you know, actually in all cases, they were, the state agencies knew it and they let it go, you know, passed them on. I, I, well, that's what I saw on that farm in, I think it was about 09, was the, yeah. the, the clean green binder. Yeah. Uh, and flipping through it was really an eye opener for me at the time as well, because uh, you know, it was the first of its kind that, that yeah. I knew of, uh, yeah. you know, and people called their stuff organic or even, you know, veganic or vegan, um, which I know you're also doing that as a certification as well, uh, along with sustainability. Uh, can you talk a little bit about like the expanded clean green program? Well, you know, we've got a, you know, this past year uh, with the pandemic, we weren't traveling as much. So um, uh, the USDA organic program authorized the use of virtual inspections and record keeping during the pandemic. So that allowed us to not travel as much. And we started investing that money. You know, we've hired, uh, you know, a great 
marketing director now in our program that uh, that started doing SEO work. And we started realizing that there were an awful lot of searches out on the Internet for vegan cannabis as well as um, regenerative you know, cannabis. And so it's easy for us. We've been in agriculture our whole lives. It's very easy. So we implemented the Clean Green Certified Vegan and the, um, and the Clean Green Certified Regenerative. Now, this has been available to farms for about a year. But the interesting thing is, is no one's passed it yet. And so um, even though people say, hey, we're vegan, when you review their inputs, they might have bone meal and, you know, feather meal in it. And uh, uh, the regenerative agriculture is a, a new term, but it really does require, you know, more active management. So a lot of people say, oh, we're clean and we're we want that sticker, but they really have to be doing it. So we do have those new programs available. We see from our online, you know, searching that those are the consumers are looking for that. And we actively are uh, hoping that some farms apply. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, we talked about growers and processors and consumers. Um, what about product licensing? Like if somebody has a nutrient brand or a soil brand, can they also uh, become Clean Green certified? Absolutely. And, you know, once we it was really interesting because after our farmers started winning so many of the awards, we started getting phone calls from their fertilizer man or woman, you know, their fertilizer salesman or their fertilizer company or their soil manufacturer. And um, they said, hey, how can we play a part in this? So we started the product licensing program years ago. And it has sort of become the Omri of the, of the cannabis world. And so because we work in the USDA organic program, you know, at, at, at such a high level, we are federally trained and able to conduct material reviews. So when a soil manufacturer or a, a, a insecticide manufacturer or a, a liquid fertilizer, anybody of dry fertilizer contacts us, we put them through a very similar review process. So the consumer, can, they can use the logo and, the, and get on our social medias and get up on our website. And the consumer can reach for a clean green certified product with greater confidence. And of course, it's they can also know that they can purchase that and it's allowed under the Clean Green program. So yeah, that's a great way for products and um, services. We've got some great service companies for sanitizing grow rooms or setting up, you know, anything. It started off years ago because it made it easy for me because I was out in the field so much. I'd say, I forget the name of the fertilizer company, but they're up on our website. And from that, it grew into you know, what it has become today. And it's really just always been an easy way for me to say, I forget, but they're, they're, check, get on our website. And so, um, hmm. yeah, it's been, it's been really grown quite a bit in the past couple of years and they're all great products. Yeah. And I, I mean, like for our listeners are mostly uh, home growers, people with hmm. the small tents and, and one room grows. And I always try to encourage them, you know, to reduce their carbon footprint in any way possible and also to uh, look for that logo on the products uh, that they purchase. And uh, th there's a digital logo as well that goes on their websites and things. Um, now, uh, I see that in 2020, uh, there were 90 farms and 30 companies licensed and over 350,000 pounds of trimmed flour certified. Yeah. Um, so I, uh, on a personal level, I just want to thank you for <laughs> you know, the last two decades of improving the quality of the cannabis because I got to smoke it all. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and it has improved. And I think that growers are much more in tune to understanding their role and the role that we all play in, in the environment uh, and in consuming a clean product, whether it's whether we're connoisseurs or aficionados or medical patients or or who or just people who don't want to uh, inhale pesticides and chemicals. So uh, I do think it's really important work. Uh, can you let people know how they can find out more information uh, if they're consumers, producers, growers, uh, product uh, licensees? 
everybody, anybody can go to our website at clean, clean green certified.com. So clean green certified.com and any farmer or processor or out retail outlet or product can get onto that website and click on um, uh, request an application. And while they're there, you know, I hope they take a moment to click on some of the fun videos and some of the history and look back at some of the awards that are on that website. It's fun to look back and see it. Yeah, a lot of companies that you're going to recognize, so many great uh, producers and, and product manufacturers um, that are doing their best to not only uh, ease their carbon footprint on the planet, but create a higher quality cannabis for all of us. Uh, because it's really about uh, the plant and the terpenes and all of the essential oils. And we want, we want that <laughs> as opposed to all the other things that can, can uh, be added on. So uh, I want to thank you, uh, Chris Van Hook, uh, founder of Clean Green Certified Program, um, the award-winning multiple many dozens and dozens of awards have been won uh, by Clean Green Certified uh, growers and processors, and uh, you've made the world a, a better place over these last two decades, and I hope, uh, I hope it continues unabated and grows worldwide. Oh, well, thank you very much, Dan. And again, it's, it was an honor to be here today. All right. Thank you very much. And uh, we will be back after these messages. If you're a grower or you're thinking about starting your first crop, then you need to know about Sweet Leaf Plant Nutrients. Sweet Leaf has an incredible line of organic fertilizers and of course, their legacy line that includes organic and some synthetic fertilizers. Check them out at sweetleaf.com. That's S-U-I-T-E-L-E-A-F.com. The code DANKO15 gets you 15% off everything at Sweet Leaf. That's 15% off their signature line of nutrients as well as essentials like complete indoor hydroponic grow tent kits and grow lights, plus awesome apparel, backpacks, and much more. If you join our Patreon, you'll get access to additional codes worth 20 and even 25% off. Patreon supporters also receive free Sweet Leaf nutrients just for signing up. Sweet Leaf provides all the tools necessary for the modern gardener. Check them out at sweetleaf.com and remember the code DANKO15. All right, welcome back, and thank you to Chris Van Hook as well, again, um, from C Clean Green Certified. Uh, really appreciate him coming on the show. Very illuminating and informative. How you doing, Mike? Oh, I'm doing good. I'm excited about this because... <laughs> and yes, this is a fortnight. And yes, this is a fortnight. Strain, Strain of the, the fortnight. fortnight. What, do you got for us, uh, what do you got for us this week? Strain of the Fortnite. <laughs> Strain of the Fortnite. All right, so it's our Strain of the Fortnite. What do you have for us this Fortnight? Yes, so this one I'm excited about. This is a great strain. Uh, it's grown and sold uh, basically by the same operation. It's called Dime Piece. Uh, the strain is from Kraft. Um, also C-R-A-F-T, uh, standing for Citizens Research Alliance for Therapeutics. This is like the place in the Bay Area if you're interested in connoisseur quality cannabis. They're known for uh, some really amazing buds and hash uh, in and around the Bay Area and beyond. Uh, but strains like Gelinade, uh, Wedding Cake, and Dime Piece, which has won awards as well. It won the Cannabis Cup uh, in 2019, the NorCal Cannabis Cup for Indica Flowers. Um, so you know it's got to be good to win in NorCal for Indica. Um, it actually tested over 30% THC, uh, but that isn't nearly the most impressive thing about the strain. Um, the terpene profile is incredible. Um, and Kraft uh, is more of like a boutique collective than a dispensary. Um, they have concierge service uh, if you're a loyal, verified member of uh, Craft or Citizens Research Alliance for Therapeutics. You uh, 
you really get the best quality small batch artisanal cannabis and it's grown with the utmost care uh, beyond organic actually in fact um, their cultivation team which is called keepers of the craft gardens uh, has been clean green certified since 2012 so they are a part of that whole clean green certification um, process and it's definitely indica dominant as mentioned having won the indica uh, cannabis cup in 2019 in norcal uh, it's got that gassiness to it but it's also fruity uh, both of those things kind of to the extreme it's like um, you know the sour gelato and the cookies in the parentage of this strain really shine through um, trichomes are just glowing and glistening like diamonds um, the flowers will stick to your fingers, uh, really kind of greasy and tacky, uh, so that if you're trying to break this up with your fingers to roll a joint, it's, it can be tough. I mean, you kind of need a grinder. Um, the scent, it's really an intoxicating blend. It's got, uh, obviously the fuel, the gassiness of the diesel, uh, in it, but also anise and sort of a sweet creamy cheese, uh, scent as well. So it's really interesting. Um, and you take a dry hit off it and you really get that anise, uh, which is kind of a licorice flavor, uh, and the gas, you know, which is predominant as well. Um, very much an indica strain in its effect as well. Very calming, uh, melts away stress. So, uh, med medicinal patients that use it, um, use it for depression, PTSD, uh, body pain for sure, because it definitely affects the body, um, pretty strongly kind of couch locky in a way without you know being too sedating um so it's 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 nice uh very much uh you know just an award-winning strain with with the smell the taste and the potency um the lineage is their original sour girl strain which is sour diesel and girl scout cookies crossed with the acai gelato uh flowering time is only eight and a half weeks so pretty decent as far as flowering when you look at a picture of it or look at the actual bud under a loop or a microscope it's just so frosty it's crazy so check out uh, bayareacraft.org if you want to learn more about craft and their strains if you're in the bay area be sure to check them out uh, it really is um, a mom and pop operation and both mom and pop are super super serious potheads and connoisseurs just like you and me so if you're in the bay and you want to try something that's really aficionado only smoke um stop by craft uh and check out dime piece all right there you go dime piece our strain of the fortnight here on episode 89 and now uh, it is time for a little grow advice from Dan each week, Danko likes to give a grow tip that will help you become a better cultivator. So what are you going to discuss this week? Yes. So this week we're going to talk about spotting and killing white flies. Um, a couple of weeks ago, maybe two or three weeks ago, we talked about fungus gnats. And I think of fungus gnats as kind of like uh, the white flies less annoying cousin or something because fungus gnats are 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 annoying but white flies are much worse if you have white flies um they're actually feeding on your plant leaves they're draining the plants of moisture this is something the fungus gnats don't do they're they're you know their larvae are an issue in the soil but at the end of the day they're not uh killing your plants uh you know the the cellular growth of your plants and white flies are the opposite they they look like little moths. Um, they're little white moths, basically. They look like that. Um, you'll see them on the underside of the leaves. And that whole time, they're just sucking the moisture out of the leaves, um, which really slows down growth. And can it also causes this kind of slimy marks that you'll see on the tops of the leaves. So a lot of times, you'll see the slimy marks first, and then you'll flip the leaf over, and then you'll see the white flies themselves. Uh, they like moist conditions, so um, just like fungus gnats as well, overwatering and high humidity is going to bring them uh, bring upon an outbreak of white flies, um, or make an existing infestation even worse. Um, 
there's a few different ways of dealing with white flies. Um, I used to recommend neem oil. I don't anymore. I think insecticidal soaps are uh, are a better alternative. Uh, if you apply those weekly uh, to the underside of the leaves, don't forget the surface of the soil too. That's where they lay their eggs. Um, you also want to remove any dead or damaged leaves from the area. Uh, you want to have yellow sticky traps around. That'll help you also uh, catch these things early because you'll see the white flies caught on the trap. Um, another thing you can do is introduce predators, in particular uh, green lacewings, uh, green lacewing larvae, uh, and ladybugs also. Ladybugs are pretty ferocious against white flies and their larvae. So uh, if you can get your hands on some ladybugs or uh, green lacewing larvae, um, those are great. You can order them through the mail. Uh, sometimes you can purchase them at a local news nursery. Um, just remember also that it's better to use multiple uh, timed applications rather than just release them all at once. Um, they'll gorge themselves and then basically they'll either migrate or starve to death. So if you can keep them in the fridge and release them, kind of time release them over a period of time, that's usually more helpful. It'll also allow them to eat the eggs and the mature uh, white flies as well. Another thing you can use is companion plants. Uh, marigolds in particular uh, repel white flies. Nasturtiums uh, will repel them and also uh, hopefully you know keep them off your weed plants as well. Uh, pyr pyrmethrin dust is also something you can kind of dust around the surface of your soil and that's that's very helpful as well. You can use that right up until you start flowering. I wouldn't really use it after that. Um, really the best way to, de to deter and avoid white fly infestation is keep your growing area clean. Um, any sign of the pests requires immediate action and continuous monitoring. So um, check your plants, check your sticky traps. Yellow sticky traps are super important for this. Anything that flies uh, will stick to those traps and give you an idea of what's what's out there. And, um, you know, they, they do weaken the plants. They suck the sap right out of the leaves. So it's not something you can ignore. They will kill your plants. And you can even make a simple solution, just liquid dish soap and water. Um, that'll kill the adult white flies and also won't harm your plants. So if you use like one tablespoon of uh, liquid dish soap, unscented, you know, uh, unfunky to about a gallon of water, mix that up, um, and spray that on the upper and undersides of your leaves and stems and everything. That's gonna help you get rid of them as well. Um, ladybugs, as mentioned. There's also uh, reflective plastic mulch. Uh, it can actually keep them from laying their eggs on the surface of your soil. So um, if you have access to something like that, that can also help prevent white flies um, or at least keep them from spreading. So, uh, Again, keep the moisture down, uh, stay vigilant, get those, always have yellow sticky traps, whether you have signs of pests or not, those will, those, will, those are a canary in a coal mine. They're going to indicate to you very early on if there's any kind of problems. And uh, don't treat white flies like you treat fungus gnats. Like fungus gnats are annoying, uh, but at the end of the day, they're not going to destroy your plants. White flies will eventually harm your garden. So... Uh, control that population and try to get rid of it altogether if you can. All right, there you go. An excellent grow tip from Danko, uh, episode 89 of Grow Bud Yourself. And it is that time now in the show where we answer some questions from our listeners. And if you have a question you would like answered, uh, get in touch with us. You could email us. That is info at growbudyourself.com. Uh, what do you say we jump right in? Let's do it. Excellent. All right. Let us start off with Andrew, and he writes, Team, I guess that's you and me. <laughs> uh, team, first off, all y'all. First off, all y'all are awesome. Thank you for what you do. My question is this Is there any downside to using auto flowering plants in a commercial grow? I've centered on the strain I want to grow, and it's available in feminized auto. And I wanted to ask the experts if there's any downside not readily apparent in choosing these specific traits. So, what would you say to Andrew? Right. Okay. So, 
this is an interesting question because this the answer to this question has changed over time. So originally, uh, auto flowering plants, um, because they were created by introducing ruderalis genetics, which is a low THC variety that automatically flowers. This is a you know you want to say northern Russian, Siberian, Hungarian kind of northern European hemp variety that was crossed into cannabis varieties in order to make them flower automatically so that you know photo period makes no difference at a certain height they just automatically start to flower and you can plant them so so the plus is you can plant them and then you know 85 90 days later you can harvest uh the downside is because those ruderalis genetics are involved there's a, a lower potency level there's a little bit less of a terpene production and so um over time that's changed so certain seed banks dynafem in particular many others have been breeding with these now over many generations and have brought potency into auto flowering plants uh, to a certain extent but i'll still say that nothing beats uh plants that are grown from regular seed uh, that are also turned into mother plants, a female plant from a regular seed that's turned into a mother plant, and then clones of that are taken and grown out in a production garden. You're, you're going to get that hybrid vigor. If you're using an F1 hybrid, you're going to get uh, just a more potent and stronger variety or, or cultivar in that case. But, uh, you know, with autoflowering plants, if you're making those into hashish, if you're doing those to make uh, any type of concentrates, rosin, uh, BHO, uh, even CO2 extraction, uh, the benefits are such that you're going to grow them much more quickly. You're going to have a shorter period of time for problems to happen. So overfeeding or pests or anything else that might occur. Uh, there's so many benefits. I mean, also f being able to harvest in June or July rather than waiting until uh, September, October, November when a lot of places get more wet uh, or there's more people out there looking for the plants or even police. So, you know, or if you're in high altitudes or uh, at a high latitude and you have a very short season, those are all the good reasons to grow autos. The downside, like I said, is a, a reduction in potency and essential oil production, which over time has become less and less of a downside. So uh, the downside was greater 10 or 15 years ago than it is now. And hopefully, you know, in the very near future, there will be no downside at all. So that's what I would tell you about that. The, the benefits, obviously, you're growing a feminized autos. Every seed is going to be a plant. Every plant is going to be able to be harvested within 90 days of planting and what you do with that plant uh whether it's s smoke the flower make hash uh make edibles uh blast it into oils or or anything else um the benefits are the quickness and all of that and the less time the downside is certainly a slight, at this point, uh, reduction in potency and essential oil production. All right, there you go. We hope that helps you out, Andrew. Uh, let's move on to Tim T. And Tim T. is interested in kicking it old school. He writes, uh, hi, I love the podcast. I was wondering if you could suggest some companies where I could buy Acapulco gold seeds uh, I'm looking for the original strain that is 100% sativa. Most of the companies I see are selling seeds that are 80-20 or 75-25. So, yeah, what would you say to Tim? Yeah, I mean, it's going to be really hard to find the original Acapulco gold without actually going to Mexico and hunting it down. There are many seed banks that sell Acapulco gold seeds, uh including our sponsor uh, rocket seeds has uh, feminized and auto flowering versions of acapulco gold that are available uh, but of course you know these are ones that are available to the general public and they've been bred uh, in order to flower within a certain parameter 
uh, which is probably not the same parameters that would happen in Acapulco, Mexico. So uh, there's a little bit of indica mixed in uh, in order to shorten those flowering times to a reasonable level. Um, other seed banks, I would say, you know, obviously Reefer Man was a big uh, proponent from about 2004 or five on of a lot of these old uh, old school strains, Acapulco Gold, Punta Roja from Colombia, uh, Colombian strains. He used a lot of uh, land race genetics in order to create his seeds, uh, and those are available through Reefer Man seeds and, and old school breeder programs. And, you know, uh, just a quick search of Acapulco Gold uh, cannabis seeds leads me to a bunch of different versions of it from Barney's Farm to Seeds Man. Um, but if you really want to get the authentic original Acapulco Gold, your best bet, you know, <laughs> I guess is probably to go to Mexico and try to find uh, the real pure sativa one. Uh, but keep in mind, you know, if you're going to find 100% sativa, you might have a 12 or 14 week flowering time. You're going to end up with really wispy, uh, loose and airy flowers. So, uh, you know, I, I would just search around, check some of the listings that are out there, check customer reviews as well, some of the forums, uh, and see where you can find legit real Acapulco gold. But I think, you know, between Reefer Man and, uh, and Rocket Seeds and, uh, a bunch of these other options that are out there in the world, uh, you'll be able to find something as close as you can to the original. And then, hey, uh, you know, you can always try to work it back and uh, select for more of those sativa type qualities and even breed, breed your own Acapulco gold if you so desire. Well, there you go. All right, Tim T. So, uh, Let's do one more here, and uh, we'll go to Patreon for this one. It comes from Ptrot420, and uh, and Ptrot writes, Hey guys, how do you feel about curing products like Grove Bags? I know in the past you didn't support the idea of curing in plastic tubs or bags, but the Terplock tech seems to be on point. I ordered a couple different sizes just to try them out, and I was pleasantly surprised. Uh, less room than jars and self-burping leaving perfectly cured buds. Seems like a win-win in my book. Uh, they even have solutions for larger scale grows that line Rubbermaid tubs, 55 gallon drums. So there you go. Uh, what, what would you say here to Petrot? Yeah, um, that's an interesting thing. And I know that there's a lot of different products out there, uh, you know, newer products that are made f specifically for the curing process. Uh, I looked up Grove bags and it does look pretty interesting uh they are bags so you know i'm concerned that you know there might be some odor or something that comes from the bag to the bud because i'm used to that but it sounds like they've kind of perfected uh how to cure in these bags without degrading thc and without affecting uh the scent or the flavor so uh I, it's interesting i have not tried these myself uh uh, people can check out grovebags.com and learn about this turp lock technology. Uh, there's a lot of interesting stuff happening. You know, obviously companies like Bovida, um, CryoCure, a lot of these companies are out there just trying to find ways to preserve terpenes and to perfect the curing process. And so I would not, you know, poo poo these bags without actually trying them out and, and, giving them a shot uh i'm still partial to opaque glass jars personally just because that's what i've always done and always learned and know um as you said i'm not into the rubber tubs or the plastic containers and certainly not paper bags or any kind of ziplocs or anything those are no way to truly cure proper cannabis uh but i'm open to trying out these grove bags i'd give them a shot uh you know, the idea that they're plastic, I think they're plastic, but, uh, you know, that originally is kind of a turnoff for me, but, uh, I'm, I'm open-minded. You know, it's one thing you have to be as a grower is, uh, being able to accept and ch test out 
new ideas because there's a lot of uh, things that we just take for granted or it's just bro science that we just assume is the way it has to be because that's the way it's always been done. Uh, and that's not the case. There, there are better ways and, and there's new science technology and, and uh, all kinds of just ways of maintaining uh, the quality of cannabis and preserving terpenes. And I think uh, these are certainly something to look into. So I'm going to check them out. I'm interested and I want to learn more. So uh, thanks for bringing that to my attention. And we'll see if we can test some of that out in the field and get back to you guys. All right. Maybe time for a little field test. Uh, thank you, Petra. Thanks to everybody who wrote in this week. Uh, that's going to do it for the uh, the cultivation segment for episode 89. Um, we are going to take another question over on Patreon about removing yellow leaves from plants. So join us on patreon.com slash Danny Danko if you're interested in that. Um, again, thanks to everyone who wrote in. If you have a question, please get in touch with us. Our email is info at growbudyourself.com. Uh, what do you think? Should we take a little break, come back, and wrap this one up? Let's do it. Hey guys, I want to tell you about one of our favorite sponsors, Excelsior Extracts. Outcast and TOH from Excelsior are incredible people, incredible growers, and they make an amazing product. Their THC-infused pain rub is made by patients for patients, and it provides powerful relief from pain. This product was developed to treat Outcast's chronic pain, and trust me, this is a super potent topical that really works. You can find out more about Excelsior on Instagram at Excelsior Extracts. That's E-X-C-E-L-S-I-O-R. E-X-T-R-A-C-T-S. Uh, DM them there to learn more about their amazing pain rub. And don't forget to tell them that Grow Bud Yourself sent you. All right, welcome back. And this is The Wrap, episode number 89. I want to thank uh, DJ Jacques and Winstrong. I want to thank Chris Van Hook of the Green Clean Certified Program. I uh, want to thank my, our friends at Craft uh, for that dime piece strain. Uh, all our sponsors, Excelsior Extracts, check out their THC-infused pain relief rub. Uh, follow them on Instagram and learn more. Sweet Leaf Nutrients, uh, the code there is Danko15 for 15% off. You can get even better codes and free products from them if you join our Patreon page at patreon.com slash dannydanko. Uh, Rocket Seeds, the code is GBY10 for 10% off of all your different seeds, feminized, regular, uh, fast flowering, auto flowering, and then some. They've got CBD strains as well. Uh, Organic Rev Growth Stimulant, the code is GBY10 for 10% off, and you can get a free sample uh, from them as well. You pay $5 for shipping and handling. You can try it out for yourself for free. Um, Vapor.com. Uh, our affiliate, the code there is GrowBudYourself20 for 20% off everything site-wide. That includes all the different vaporizers, Volcanoes, Puffco, Peak Pros, and everything else. And now you can get a free lanyard uh, with any purchase over $75 and a free hat, uh, Vapor.com hat, with any purchase over $150. So check out Vapor.com. They've got rolling papers, raws, everything uh, all the accessories, CBD products, and everything else that you might need. Um, the code GrowBudYourself20 gets you 20% off. I don't believe they have any other 20% off uh, site-wide codes in the world. So I, I think you can find the 15%, the 10% off. Uh, but we're the only ones with the 20% off there. And that's pretty substantial when you're paying three or 400 bucks for, for a nice vape. So check out Vapor.com. Check out Patreon.com. Thank you to all our supporters. We're doing a bunch of giveaways coming up, uh, a bunch of Rocket Seed stuff and uh, some of our other sponsors. So thank you to you guys for listening, all our supporters. Episode number 89 is in the books. 